and welcome to episode 28 of the Offline Gamer. I'm Matt. I'm Ray. And this month we have a third person uh, with us online, and it's our old friend Sneaky Pete himself, Peter Hazelwood. Hello, mate. You okay? Hello. I am very well, thank you. Good. It's nice to have you back. Thanks for uh, for joining us. We'll have a good old chat about things a bit later. Uh, so you're mainly here because... Um, we're going to have a chat with you a bit later about uh, Aircon because uh, you attended. Unfortunately, due to a situation which I'll mention in a little bit, we weren't able to go. So, uh, yeah, we thought we'd get you on to uh, let us know how that was. Although we'll talk about it a lot later, just give us a brief version. Was it was it a good weekend? It was a very nice weekend. Um, it's a very nice con, and Harrogate is a delightful place. So it's probably going to become an annual thing now without giving any spoilers away but we had such a good time this year i should imagine we may head back up every march stay for you know a couple of nights enjoy the harrogate area and just a very nice convention so before we get on to our main topics uh we better talk about where we've been for the last well nearly five months now um since we put an episode before christmas um, as those people who know me and follow me on social media will know, I had a bit of a rough time at the start of this year. Um, the stuff I've talked about in episode one with my anxiety and my depression came back. So that basically meant for nearly three whole months I didn't do anything, I wasn't at work. Uh, things were very difficult, but thankfully I'm on the mend, uh, I'm getting help and I'm on medication and... I'm back at work, uh, part time. So you know things are things are looking good, thankfully. Because it was a bit rough there for a while. But uh, I don't know if you two have got any questions that you think our listeners might have about uh, the last few months. But uh, if you have, then you should go for it. I can't think of any. No, that's <laughs> fine. No, I was not well. I am now doing much better. Thank you. Yay. <laughs> so yeah i haven't really been up to a lot um i've played a few games which we'll talk about in a bit um ray what have you been up to in the last three four months not a big amount mostly digital games yeah uh, so i got hand of fate 2 for my birthday Ooh. or no christmas i think um which you, are... you've you've written birthday present there but because your birthday and Christmas is so close to each other, it's probably difficult for you to remember. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was Christmas because I know who it was from and I know what he got me for my birthday, so it was definitely Christmas. Okay. Um, so I got Hand of Fate 2 for Christmas. Um, so I installed that and started playing, having not actually finished the first game. Um, and then was sitting there going, what? So I went back and pretty much finished Hand of Fate. Um, the first game. I didn't actually finish the final boss fight, but having started the second game, I can pretty much guess how it goes. Mm. Um, bizarrely, like I stopped playing Hand of Fate a while ago because I got just completely stuck. And when I went back to it, I just completely breezed through the last the three sections that I was really stuck on before to the point where it just infuriated me so much I stopped playing um, and then I got stuck on Hand of Fate 2 after about three encounters so basically what, you, what you're saying is you'll leave that for a few weeks and then go back to it and you'll probably breeze through that as well probably I also uh, got the game the new, the newest game Prey i.e. not the one from decade or so ago the one that came out was it last year yeah i talked about it but when i was playing it didn't i yeah so i got that in a steam sale and then played that for a while in february i think and then um a new uh watch my jig a new league came out for path of exile so then i started playing path of exile for about a mm -hmm. month and then a new expansion for hearthstone came out so since that's what i've been playing since then yeah, I've played a lot of that. I it's it's very different to the previous expansions. There's a lot more um uh card interaction, I would say. Yeah. And the new mechanics make things a bit more interesting. I've only tried the new solo mode once. 
Um, and I got right through to the final boss, but then oh, you did. I can't got... get past like I can't do more than like four in a row. I've really struggled with it. I think I think I just got lucky because some of them I was thinking, no, I'm dead, hundred percent dead. I think on one of them I got down to about nine health or something, and then somehow managed to kill them before they killed me, and that sort of thing happened twice. And then on the last one, I got the Whisperer, who just echoes everything, mm. which meant that I think it was him. Anyway, yeah, I basically just got trounced. <laughs> um, but I haven't been able to play very much in the board game territory. Oh, that's um, a shame. So it's just been mostly digital stuff. You did get a board game for Christmas, though, didn't you? I did. From someone. Don't know who. Um, I believe it was you, Matt. Oh, was it? Oh, okay. What um, game was I, that, Ray? I got Dice Forge, which um, I'm pretty sure I mentioned after seeing it at UKG because I thought it looked quite fun. Yeah. And I've set it all up. Um, and I've set it all up and I've put it all in the box in the right place because it comes with a, a sheet that says, this is how you should pack it in the box to make it easy for your setup. So I've done all of that, and I've put all the faces on the dice, ready to go for the first play. Um, but I haven't actually had a chance to play it yet. That's really good. More games should do that. Have some guides to how you put things away in a box, because setup time is a right pain for a lot of games. Yeah, especially when you can't find anything. It was very confusing, though, because there's, there's one section that's trying to tell you how to set it up, which refers to another section, which is how to set up the whole, like, um, set up the board when you get it out. And I couldn't figure it out for ages what on earth it was talking about. And I had to Google it. And it turns out that the, the tiny, tiny little, like, uh, picture next to it was actually supposed to indicate what everything was and where it went because... It, it was sort of half see-through and it was trying to show you something on the other side as well as something on the front side. And I was just sat there for ages going, I don't understand. Why are you telling me to set it up like in step seven? Step seven tells me nothing. Step seven just says, set it up like in step one. So I was just sat there for ages getting really frustrated with it. Uh, but I did Google it in the end and figured it out. I'm guessing there was a thread on BGG of other people going, what am I supposed to do here? I think so, yeah. Did you get anything for Christmas, Matt? Oh, I got a game as well, yes. Did you really? Yeah, that was from you. Oh, was it? Yeah, you got me Race to the North Pole. Yeah. Because we saw this, uh, well, it was nearly two years ago now, um, at UKG 2016, when we met the Dyes guys for the first time, because this is the game that they did before they started developing the app. And it was the game that the app... Um, they used to demonstrate the app, wasn't it? The, the, the game, the app told us how to play the game. So, yeah. Um, yeah, that's a game with a big board and it's got a big circular thing on the top. That's, you know, a, a map. It's supposed to be the North Pole, but, you know, just a, with different routes around. But there's like, you can have these wind, gusts of wind that occur during the game. And so you rotate the circular bit 90 degrees and it changes the layout. So there's all these like transparent parts and that they can have hazards underneath them that change as you move the board around. So that's quite interesting. It's not anything deep. It's just a nice, fun family game. But uh, I, I quite like the look of it. So, yeah, thank you. No problem. You you made a good choice. I hope I made a good choice. Yes. We'll actually have to play it at some point. If we will. <laughs> Dice Forge, I think, I mean, thematically, I mean, well, it's sort of like... It's interesting, isn't it? Because we've got Mystic Veil vale now, which is all about building your own cards. And we've got Dice Forge, which is about building and customising your own dice. Yeah. I, I, like, I like the fact that those new mechanics have uh, appeared in the last couple of years. Mind you, it's always the same, isn't it? People will build on existing ideas, but then occasionally you'll get someone who goes, ah, this has never been done before, let's do that. And then all of a sudden that starts to be something that other people develop as well, so... I mean, yeah. how much further can you deconstruct games right down to such a micro level where you're building your own cards, your own dice? It's, uh, yeah. People always come up with a new way of doing something very different. 
I mean, thinking about it, people have been building boards for years because if you've got a tile-based game, that's effectively what yep. you're doing, isn't it? So Absolutely. what else is there? Make your own manual uh, rule book. They give you uh, <laughs> just all the components in the box and say, there you go. Cool. Um, okay, well, Ray talks about what she's played. So I've played a few board games, mainly over Christmas. So I'll go through those. So the first game I played, this was um, I had a family get together as we do every Christmas so I took a couple of games with me to that so the first one was uh, in fact the, both the games we played were two that I had arrived uh, from Kickstarter not long before Christmas so uh, there was Master Thief which is the card game where everyone plays uh, cat burglars trying to steal uh, is cat burglars the right phrase or is cat burglars specifically for people breaking into other people's houses I don't know I don't know cat no. burglars is like Really stealthy burglars. Stealthy burglars, yeah, like ninjas. Yeah. So you're you you you're all like breaking into a museum, stealing artifacts. And there's lots of like famous pieces of art in the game, like the Mona Lisa and things like that. And uh, the cards all get like laid out on the table haphazardly, face down, and you sort of take it in turns swiping a thing from the museum um, but it might be a bad card, like a security guard or something like that. But you can also pick up cards that you can use. Uh, on other players to to scupper them, you know. So there's a little bit of uh, uh, player interaction uh, as well as just trying to build up your collection of of artifacts. And I think, you know, that's a short 15, 20-minute card game, but uh, it's the sort of thing I enjoy playing with a family, to be honest, you know. So I I really like that. I think that was a good good game. And the other thing I played at that time was Five Seals of Magic, which is the one where there's a big dungeon... And you all start in the middle, and then you roll. There's like pools of dice that have been rolled, and you can take dice from the pool to try and break the seals in the doors to work to work your way through the dungeon. And then, as you break doors and go into new rooms, you find cards that help help you manipulate the dice rolls to make them more powerful. Which means you can break more seals and explore more of the dungeon so that's that was quite good as well and i say i play most of these games at the family gatherings with people who aren't really into games and so i always try to pick ones that don't have too complex rules because obviously i don't want to overload them or anything and uh, yeah both of those games went down really really well yeah i just remember we played pandemic on christmas day oh did you um with my parents and my brother um uh we lost but <laughs> by like two turns it's not unusual for people to lose their first game though i don't think yeah but we we almost got there um everybody seemed to enjoy it and everybody sort of figured it out eventually my mom did keep asking the same question over and over <laughs> again but i think that was a fairly um Entry level ish. Yeah. Don't how know did how they react to the f- fact that it was a co op? Because obviously, most people's experience of board games who've never got into the hobbies, just like the competitive stuff where they're all playing against each other, how did they feel that it was a. Uh... Well, I think it helped that it was a co op because obviously nobody knew what they were doing. Yeah. I mean, I kept having to refer to the rules. Yeah. Um, but I think it helped everybody else to sort of know that it wasn't just one against everybody because if you just introduce a bunch of complete newbies to something and it's all every man for himself then they're probably not going to enjoy it because they're struggling to understand and there's also the pressure of oh you've got a win-win yeah i think my brother really enjoyed it as well because we got right to the end and he was like can we play again i want to win i want to win i want to <laughs> win good. i'm like we can but it's not ne- it's not always guaranteed to win that's the that's the the beauty of a pandemic but yeah that was that was good fun cool uh, a few days later um i went round to a friend's house and spent the evening with them and i took the escape room in a box with me so i won't give any spoilers away cuz uh, i intend to play that with you at some point but uh, okay. effectively it is basically an escape room you open the box and then a timer starts and then um yeah you have to solve all the puzzles before the the time runs out there's a few hints in there and at at some at one point you get something that will allow you to extend the time another half an hour if you solve something right so all in all you get an hour and a half but we managed to do it just 
over the the first hour. Something in the book does say that if you're really good, you can do it in 14 minutes. But mm. you know, <laughs> no, that a challenge? With us. So they've given me a little refill pack. So there's a few things I need to print out off the website. A couple of components that I I aren't reusable, but they've given like a supply of them in the box. There's like five of them, so we can replay the game. Well, I can replay it with other people five times. Yeah. But what will happen now is because I know the outcome of the game, I will be the narrator and I will be the person with all the hint books and they'll be the ones, you know, if they need a hint, they'll ask me rather than just reading a book and I've got a script and, and all sorts of stuff. So I am the evil professor. <laughs> Is that going to be like, um, oh, what was the game we played? Like the choose your own adventure type thing. Where you were the computer? Oh no, not quite like that because the the, the game itself is it does itself. So I I'll just read out the starting script and then I might like interject with the odd comment here and there, but I'm not actually controlling the flow of the game. Okay. So uh, yeah, you'll see when we uh, when we play it. I think you'll mm. enjoy it. There's a lot of good puzzles in there, and there's locks awesome. and things that you have to work out the combinations to and stuff like that. So so yeah, it's good. Oh. Really love that. It. Love love that sort of nonsense. Yeah, it's just like a real escape room. Yeah. Except this is basically when you open the box, a toxin's been released, and you've got to find the cure to it. Otherwise, you will get turned into werewolves. Uh, okay. Yep. Uh, and then just to cook, uh, just yesterday, as of recording, actually, uh, I went around my friend's house and we continued our pandemic legacy campaign. Um. Again, no spoilers, but we're in June and we lost the first game in June. So let's see how it goes. But thank you. That means that a, the second game will be a bit easier. This is season one, isn't it? What's that? Sorry, season it's one. Yeah, season one. Yeah, because now obviously there's two. Yeah. Pandemic legacies. Oh, I bought someone a game for Christmas actually as well. Uh, my friend Nick, who I played the escape room with, I bought him a copy of um, Game of Thrones: Catan. Oh, okay. I basically I know they wanted um, Legacy Season Two, but uh, Nick's dad got that for for them. So I uh, looked for something else, and they're big Game of Thrones fans. So I thought I'd get them get them that. And, awesome. Uh, yeah, we'll be playing that at some point. It does seem to fit the um, Catan theme quite well. Yeah, more so than say Star Trek Catan, which I'd yeah. still like, but you know. Yeah. Because I'm a Trekkie, so. Obviously. Yeah. Uh, and then, computer games-wise, I've been playing a lot of retro games on my Raspberry Pi with Retro Pi. I bought a controller, actually, last weekend, um, which was a, a modern recreation of a Super Nintendo one, mm-hmm. which actually I found to be a lot better. I was using an Xbox 360 controller up to that point, but the D-pad is a bit mushy, because obviously most games these days don't use the D-pad, they use the analog sticks. Yeah. Um, but yeah, on um, on the Pi with all the retro 2D games like Sonic and Mario and all sorts of stuff like that, um, the uh, the SNES controller works really well. So it feels a bit weird playing Sonic with a Super Nintendo controller, but there you go. And other than that, yeah, Hearthstone. Um, I started playing a new online Star Trek card game, which has just gone early access called Star Trek Adversaries. Oh, yeah, I, I saw something about that. The, 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 the minions are ships. And then you can play crew on the ships to um, boost their powers and things like that. It's, it's oh, quite good. I enjoy okay. it. I'm not very good at it, but it's enjoyable. Oh, I see. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I think that's pretty much all I've been playing. Pete, what have you been up to while, you, while you're here? Have you been playing any fun games the last few weeks? Oh, my goodness. Well, my appetite for board gaming is just voracious. It's, uh, it's never satisfied. <laughs> so... Uh, the last few months, the, the game I've really been enjoying is Shogun, which is a an original 2006 game, but it's set in feudal Japan, and it sounds like a, a big uh, area control combat game, but it's it's very elegant, and it's there is combat involved, but you get a potential 10 actions every round, only two of which can be combat. So it's uh, very interesting. It's almost got a Euro game feel to it, and it's just brilliant fun uh only trouble is that it takes a while <laughs> uh to play so i'm having sort of monthly get togethers now in my house to play shogun because it is too good not to play regularly okay cool i'll have to have a look at that because uh yeah I've, i think i've seen a few pictures you've posted online of, of games of it as well yeah just uh yeah i i wouldn't say it would be it would be for everybody but 
uh, I'm a big fan. I think it's supremely well designed. So that's what we've been uh, playing and buying and stuff. Um, one last piece of news then before we uh, start having a good old chat about Aircon with Pete. Um, the map or the, the, the floor plan for UKGE is now out on the website. Now, probably everyone listening to this knows that. But what I've been doing is I've been checking it every few days because they have been updating it. So if you went on the site and viewed and downloaded the one that was there when they put it out initially, there have been at least seven revisions to that since wow. uh, Since then. So Because I, 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 what I do is I go to the page, uh, load the PDF, and then in, in my browser you can view the date it was last updated. And I've been, as I update, saving and comparing the versions, and they've been like adding lots of little, um, like splitting one stall up into two. So they've got two smaller exhibitors there or whatever, things like that. But also they've moved around where the the gaming area is and some of the tournament stuff on that other side of the, the hall as well. So yeah, they're, they're up, but they've slowed down in the last week or so. They haven't been putting as many updates out. So they're definitely obviously starting to lock it down. Um, but I think I'm going to do what I did before. Um, I've got Adobe Acrobat uh, installed and it'll let me edit the PDF file now. So once a few days before the expo, I will go through the list of exhibitors and I'll label the map because I, I just find it a lot easier to have to look at that and it says, oh, I-79, who's in I-79? And then you'll go to the program and look up who I-79 is or whatever. And I think it's easier that if you're walking up and down the aisles and you can see the names of the exhibitors on the map as well, it just helps you figure out what's what's what. Maybe that's just me. And it's a, it's probably a very, very geeky thing to do, but... I'm very disorganized. I just walk <laughs> around and stop where it looks interesting, to be honest. Well, I'm hoping we'll get a list of planned games that are due to be there like we have on the last couple of years we were actually having a gnat about that before we started recording weren't we but the uh there's a guy on bgg who normally does a list of all of the games that are going to be there and he hasn't started one yet he, he normally starts it around this time so i'm hopeful he'll he'll do that but if not then it's just going to be a you know a magical mystery tour into the unknown but <laughs> it, hopefully we'll get a list of everything and uh be able to mark or you know points of interest before we before we get there to be honest i think a more organized approach will be more necessary than ever because of just how big it is getting a ridiculous yeah. size now uh, we're we're quite lucky because we get to go to the press preview which is now on the thursday evening as opposed to the friday morning so some of the exhibitors we want to see might be there so we won't need to we'll also be able to have a chat with them and see their stuff without the hordes of people around which is obviously a lot nicer yeah. Um, so tip to all you people out there start your own podcast or blog and then you can get a press pass to the UKG uh, which also means that the show opens earlier on the Friday as well because last year was it 11am it opened wasn't the press ah. preview from 9 till half 10 and then right. it opened at 11 but this year it'll be opening at 9 o'clock on the Friday yeah and they made us sit in that room with very uncomfortable chairs for like half an hour oh yeah you see, because I was researching when it was open on the Friday, and I thought it was open later. And uh, yeah, I think it's starting at nine uh, on the Friday this year. So that has yeah. just joined the dots together. Yeah, it means after work on the Thursday, we'll be driving to the NEC and then... Uh... Are you there for the duration? Because yeah. that's, that's hardcore, that is. Oh yeah, we're going to do all three days, aren't we, Ray? And the you mean press four preview. days. Four, well, yeah, three and a half, <laughs> maybe, but... I'm off on Thursday, so I'll, I'll oh, have yeah, okay. lots of lovely time I, to I, prepare. I didn't book that off. I, my, I was not as... Uh, no, I've got, as I've got Thursday and Friday off because I've got a training day on Monday and then I've got Tuesday off. Okay. So I thought I needed the Thursday off because otherwise I'd have Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Yeah. Following a full regular... I'd have like, what, eight days solid of... of Nine to five. So Thursday is your chill day before the madness. Yes, yes. I didn't think about that. Monday is mine, um, but I'll probably spend most of Monday editing audio and video. So there we go. Well, you can think of me. I'll be very bored. Well, I mean, totally interested in my training course. It's funny. I was talking to a friend of mine uh, the other day and talking to him about board games and showing him the footage we did last year. Uh, mm. Because obviously he, he he never saw me as the type of person who would be in front of a camera. Because you know, 
shock horror, I used to be quite shy and timid and would never want to do a podcast or a, a vlog or anything like that. Yeah. And uh, I showed him actually, Pete, the video where I was interviewing you. Oh, no. And uh, he was very impressed. And he step. said, oh, he looks <laughs> like he, he really enjoyed being interviewed. And I was like, yeah, he did. He loved it. <laughs> Pete's always happy, though. <laughs> so that's what we've been playing recently and uh, a little bit of news so now let's move on to our topic of the month so pete this is where you get to shine this is my moment is it you know the big build-up okay <laughs> yes well so obviously i was expecting to go to aircon with my good podcast buddies <laughs> uh, and was sad to hear that you wouldn't be making it after all but uh i went and i took Emma with me. I mean, she came with me to Harrogate last time, but she didn't come to Aircon. Uh, and this yeah. year she said she'd quite like to come for a day, and I was very pleased by that. So we went in 2017, which was uh, our first year, our first visit to Aircon. And, well, I say we, I. And I didn't know many people, and it was honestly a bit of a struggle. And this partially comes down to personality and how you approach convention. I have infinitely more fun when I'm going with people who I know, and I just want to hang out with my friends and go around or play something. And somehow it just it, it doesn't work so well for me if I'm on my own. But on the, on, the, on the whole, the convention was good. There were a good number of exhibitors, uh, although it felt like they were sort of set slightly apart from the open gaming area. And that is the priority of Aircon is big open gaming areas, but they still want to support their exhibitors. So that was a little bit of an issue last year. So that was 2017. Uh, this year, I mean, they are growing at a huge rate. I'll give you some stats later on as to how quickly Aircon is growing. But they moved to a new part of the uh, Harrogate Exhibition Centre, which I think it's called. And I saw some photos ahead of time. Uh, so this, the main hall was this really quite large room. I mean, it feels like the NEC, maybe on a, a smaller scale, but still, a, you know, a big, big arena, really. And no natural light. I noticed that when I looked at the photos and I thought, oh, I'm really not sure about being in a, a big room all day playing games under this yellow lighting. Um, <laughs> anyway, I absolutely didn't even notice it when I was there. Have <laughs> no effect on me whatsoever. Oh, okay. And although it was a big space, it didn't feel impersonal. It felt good. There was a lovely atmosphere and a big buzz on the Saturday, which was presumably the biggest day, although I wasn't there on the Sunday, but I should imagine the Saturday was the big day. I mean, there was a queue, an actual Essen-style queue to get in before the doors were officially opened. Uh, but anyway, that was the Saturday. Friday, we went, and I'd actually won a competition for some table time on a Geek & Sun gaming table. Oh, Yes, indeed. So that was very nice. I mean, I know Martin and Geek and Thun quite well by now, but it was nice to just have some time that I could <laughs> play a nice game on one of their tables and start, you know, putting in the groundwork, making hints to Emma that, you know, eventually when we move, we, you know, we might have to look into one of these. <laughs> Did she cry when she saw how much they were? Um, I think we probably already talked about how much they were, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, an eye-watering amount. Um, but they are very good, and if you compare their prices to other manufacturers, I mean, they're all expensive. It's not the Geek & Sun are expensive, it's the gaming tables are expensive. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, we uh, met some new friends and old friends, so I've made a number of acquaintances, you know, relationships with people on the Board Game Trade & Chat UK Facebook group. So I got to yeah. meet a couple of people I'd only spoken to on the internet and we played Spirium uh, uh, it was very nice uh, then our next stop was at the Bring and Buy which unlike the expo was actually big enough and nicely you know laid out with games clearly visible on shelves and tables uh, I don't mean to knock the expo they have such a high volume of people and games it must be impossible but they increase the space every year but it never seems enough <laughs> It was okay. Uh, they were, I wasn't overwhelmed by the number of <laughs> interesting games that were in there, okay. but I did come away with a bargain. I picked up Nippon, which is sort of it's a, a game about the industrialization of Japan, 
intrigue for £35. So I had an inkling that might be an OK price, and it was a bit cheaper than new. Uh, tell you what, that's a great game. <laughs> Fantastic. Rather heavy, but very, very good. As for uh, exhibitors, it felt like there was a good number of them, a nice blend between retailers and demos. I actually didn't spend all that much time going around the exhibitors, uh, apart from uh, regularly going to chat with my friends at Karmic Games. Um, <laughs> but that's just kind of how it worked with my weekend. It was a very structured convention for me rather than the disorganized wander around the expo that i'll be doing in a couple of months one of the highlights was uh they have an rpg zone which is run by paizo and rpgs is something i've never really done i've done one session of shadow run with some of my gaming group who are in the, a lot of us are in the same group in that we're interested by the concept but nobody in our group really is that into it and you need it, it's so daunting uh, the the uh, feeling of trying to get into an RPG it, it's so different to a board yeah. game and you really need uh, an experienced GM to run something and we don't I mean we have a couple of people who have GM'd but you know it's you need somebody who's willing to spend a lot of time and effort to organize and run these sessions so one of the great things about this Paizo RPG zone is that you could just turn up and talk to them and then sign up for taster sessions over two or three hours you pay a nominal extra charge i think it was two pounds per person and then you go and you are in the hands of these highly experienced gms taking you through how uh, you know a, a scenario in these games might work so emma and i actually uh, did one together on the friday night we did warhammer fantasy roleplay i I've described in my notes as chaotic and rather silly, but still a good laugh. And I think that's about that's about right. Um, okay. A lot of dice rolling, a lot of hilarity. And it was, it was a really good night because we had a bottle of wine and one of the party, you know, we, a whole bunch of people we've never met before. It was his birthday and he was just having a great time playing this RPG with us. So that was really quite fun. But it became clear that it was not going to be something that I want to play again really <laughs> what i do want to play again is the one ring so i eventually decided a few months ago that i was just going to bite the bullet and speak to a couple of people in my group and we would all uh, start a campaign with the one ring which is set between the hobbit and the lord of the rings so i will be the law master which is the gm and so it's mm -hmm. uh, it's going to be uh, bit weird uh, because I've never really played RPGs so we're all going to be learning as we play this but yeah but we're going into it with our eyes open but it was fantastic because I was able to do a demo on the Saturday of the one ring and it was exactly what I was hoping for the nature of the game focus on exploration and different skills and it's not just about I've got a group of uh, you know travelers in my group and we're going to fight monsters that just holds very little attraction to me i want i want more <laughs> so i'm actually i'm really excited to start this one ring campaign and really get into grips with middle earth because there's just so much plot so much history written by tolkien but also just sort of um the, the whole canon is huge now and then you've still got the freedom to create your own your own world really uh based around yeah. these events that are already documented it's probably going to be an easier thing to get into because the p people know the world already so they're not going Absolutely. in completely blind uh, that's it i mean i bought a pdf of uh, another rpg and i couldn't get past the second page because it was about 150 pages or something <laughs> ridiculous and i don't even know what this world is i have a great idea of the lord of the rings worlds so yeah it's a perfect starting point for us so, uh, so yeah, getting to demo, that was a real treat. So I said before that open gaming is very much the focus of Aircon, and uh, they had a huge amount of space. Even on the Saturday, it was very busy, but there was still space. You could find places to game, and a big library of games to borrow, so that was nice. Although, again, I didn't really do much of that. Yeah, it, and they had a similar signage system, uh, for finding gamers or 
uh, open games as last year's. And it's still not foolproof, but I'm starting to wonder if there really is a perfect solution to the constant problem of how do you find a game uh, that's right for you and uh, you know a lot of us are shy even if you're not shy it still feels awkward trying to find people to play games with yeah so i um, i regret that i don't have the answer to this either <laughs> it's a problem that i consider every year before the great indoors working out how to make it as easy as possible if they just want to play a game uh, maybe they don't have one or they want to try something new how do you go about finding a game or people to play with? Uh, yeah, as I say, I don't yeah. have the answer. My answer really is to avoid it and to just go with people you know or arrange meetups ahead of time, which is what I did this year at Aircon. So, yeah, that, that works for me. Other people will be <laughs> willing and able to just go up to strangers and say, please, can I join you for a game? Uh, <laughs> I just am not very good at that. <laughs> Yeah, I would struggle with that quite a lot. It's tricky. It's definitely tricky. Uh, food and drink was very good and not hideously expensive, although they did run out of bottled water about 11 o'clock on Saturday, <laughs> Saturday morning. Oh. So, yeah, something to think about. There's beers for the rest of the weekend then, yeah? Um, uh, no comment. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, special guest. They had got Rodney Smith from Watch It Played all the way from Canada. And yes. uh, that was that was a big draw. There was an awful lot of appreciation for him. And I don't know if you saw the news this week. He is actually going to be teaming up with Board Game Geek going forward. So he won't need to run oh, no, I hadn't seen that. fundraisers or, you know, Patreon campaigns or whatever, at least for, I think they're going to try it out for a year, see what happens. So that's really good news because he is a fantastic mm-hmm. presenter and he's so thorough with his rules explanations. It, I know that he is. He feels very awkward about fundraising and asking, you know, punters like you or me to to pay money for his content. So it feels like a really good, really good fit. But anyway, he was at Aircon, and yes, as I say, wildly popular. And I hope that we see more of him over in the UK. It'd be good to see him at the expo as well. Although I'm not sure. I've not heard that he's coming to the expo this year. Although I know that the uh, the Dice Tower crew is expanding in terms of who's coming over for it this year. So that's good. Yeah. So let me just give you some stats about Aircon to leave you with. So we've got unique attendance for 2018 was 1,593, up from 638 mm-hmm. in 2017. Wow, that's a massive. It's a huge increase. increase, yeah. And the overall footfall was also increased quite dramatically, uh, 2,944, up from 1,308. So yeah, big increases. And Aircon has not been around all that long. The first Aircon was in 2015. The first public one was April 2016 with about 100 people. And then next year, they're just getting bigger and bigger. And uh, I asked Mark, one of the organisers, what's going to be special about it. And he's not really giving much away, but he said they're planning lots of fun stuff, a bigger trade area and some more special guests but the focus is still on playing games with huge open gaming areas. So there you go. So I guess, I guess long term, that's uh, sort of what you would like to emulate with your event. Uh, that would be wonderful. Um, I think uh, we need to be realistic. I mean, I, <laughs> I don't have uh, a, any information about the finances of Aircon uh, apart from. Uh, hearsay. Uh, they're going about things in a different way, <laughs> not a better or worse way, but they are obviously uh, attempting very rapid growth by moving into this hugely uh, expensive but perfect location, the North's equivalent of the NEC. Yeah. And you know they are they are working very hard to uh, to get those numbers up quickly. It, that's what it feels like to me. I don't have that from Mark and Ben, but that's what it seems like. Um, I would love to think that the Great Indoors will continue to grow until it becomes, you know, a, a decent-sized uh, convention. But I think we will be on a much uh, more gentle trajectory, hopefully, continually. <laughs> so yeah, so uh, next year's Aircon is eighth to the tenth of March, twenty nineteen. And as I hinted before, 
I imagine uh, we'll be there. So I hope you guys will be too. Yeah, and hopefully we will be as well. But somewhere we'll definitely be in a few weeks is at the Great Indoors. So what can you tell us about what you've got planned for this year? Oh, boy. Well, uh, as I told you, um, not a lot at this point, if I'm being brutally honest. I can tell you, uh, so if people don't know already, the Great Indoors is a very nice, family-friendly gaming convention held in Worcestershire. So I'm in Bromsgrove. And this year, the venue is in Bromsgrove. And for the first time, it will be over two days. So we are doing the Saturday and the Sunday. It's the 28th and 29th of July. And you've got the full day on the Saturday, 10 till 10, and a slightly shorter day on the Sunday, which is 10 till 6. But yes, the new venue is bigger. So we're, we're, uh, we've agreed a capacity of about 140 a day. So if we were to sell out, that's 280 tickets, which would be a, a very large growth from last year. So we'll, we'll see about that. <laughs> Um, but central location means we've got better transport links and there's a whole heap of food and drink options nearby if people want to go out and get stuff because we won't probably be able to cater with full meals this year, but we will have a uh, a constantly open bar with uh, soft drinks, alcohol and snacks, so that'll be good. Hopefully, one of the perks of the newer venue although it's obviously a lot more expensive than last year's as long as we sell a decent uh, volume of tickets uh, we should easily break even or possibly make a profit and the tickets will be quite a lot cheaper so i i I was conscious last year that the ticket price had got to a level where i I was a bit unhappy with where it was but we needed to (laughs) you know we need to break even there's there's no getting around it this is not something that emma and i can afford to just finance out of our pockets every year so it is a it is a real balancing act between wanting people to come along and have a great day and feel like they got value for money and also maybe making a slight a slight profit which would be nice but anyway if you're looking at a, a single day ticket for instance on the saturday it would be eight pounds for an adult and six for concession and family discount is basically 25% off whatever ticket you're buying. So hopefully that will entice people in. So a family of four for the, the two days is only £30. So I think that's quite good value, really. Yeah, absolutely. We will continue to offer an extensive games library and family area. We've got very kind people from the Redditch Wargaming Society are going to get involved this year. And they are going to be running some games, not necessarily war games, but we're looking at things like X-Wing, uh, Blood Bowl, uh, those types of things. So that's really great that they're coming on board because the bigger the event gets and the more ambitious we are, the more help I need and the more volunteers we need to, to make it work. So I definitely hope, uh, you know, we're still a bit light on exhibitors. So what I'm hoping is in the next couple of months, I will have a full and exciting list of exhibitors uh, to go along with everything else and it should be a good weekend and by the time people listen to this the tickets will in fact be on sale so if you want any more information you can go to www.great-indoors.co.uk okay well thanks for that pete i mean we're really looking forward to it and uh, wish you all the best so yeah thank you very much i look forward to seeing you there uh I will see you before then, though, so, yeah. (laughs) Yes. So let's have a mosey on over to Kickstarter Corner, Uh, usual look at what we've been backing, what we've had arrive, and what we've got our eyes on. But first, a couple of bits of Kickstarter news. Um, Those people who watch our unboxing videos on YouTube will know that sometimes I put in a little clip of the, the video from Kickstarter, but what I've always had to do with those is upscale them because they've never had HD videos. Um, they've always been like quite low res, like 360p or something, and which I've had to upscale so they always look really blocky. Um, although when I was doing my most recent uh, video, I downloaded the project video and noticed it was in 720p. So I had a look on the Kickstarter blog, and as of February, they now allow content creators to upload HD videos. I can't believe it's taken them so long to allow that. Especially for for games, because obviously you can see a lot more detail in the components and things like that if you're watching a HD video. So I think that's a definite improvement, and uh, uh, you know, something that I can't believe it's taken them this long to do. 
And the other thing is, um, I noticed a bug in the iOS app. I think it's probably present in the Android app as well. I obviously save a lot of projects that I've got my eyes on. Um, not necessarily back them all, but a lot of them I just click save to remind me about them. It looks like a couple of projects I've saved have just got removed for whatever reason, but because they've never been unsaved, they sort of like exist as phantom projects in the background. So on the app, when I look at how many I've got saved, if I've got none, it still says I've got three. And no matter how many I've got saved, it's got three more than I actually have. So I reported this to them a couple of months ago and they said, yeah, yeah, we'll look into this and fix it. As of yet, I've not heard anything about it. It's funny because the website is fine, but the, the app shows the wrong number. It's it's just really annoying me <laughs> for no good yeah, reason. That's frustrating. Yeah, it just means it'll say, "Oh, I've got ten. Pro- I've got ten projects back." Oh no, I haven't. I've only got seven. But I need to look at. <laughs> so it's like, oh yeah. But yeah, it's it's not really a major problem. It's just a minor annoyance to me. But uh, and I don't know how many other people will be in the same boat, to be honest. But so let's have a look at what we've been backing. Uh, Ray, you've backed a few things since we last spoke. Yep. So I. You may remember that um, I previously backed Nemo's War. Yeah, the, the game that sat in the back of my car for two weeks. Yep, while I was moving house. Um, so they had a, a small expansion, which is called the Nautilus Upgrades. So I, I backed that. I think it was like a tenner or something, um, which expands, funnily enough, on uh, the upgrades you can do to the Nautilus in the main game. I also backed... Um, some play, uh, well, a play mat um, from a company that's down in London actually, and for once was some fairly nice designs, fairly neutral, so not specific to a certain game or universe. Yeah. Um, and weren't ridiculously over expensive. What sort of material are they? Um, I think I, I honestly can't remember. Okay. I'm, I'm sure they're probably something like the sort of thing you get like fancy mouse mats out of right yeah and then at some prompting from you matthew uh cat rescue which is a game about running a cat rescue funnily enough and you have to rescue cats and then get them adopted and so on um and also the second edition of argonauts which was on um I don't know, possibly about a month ago now. Mm. So Argonauts itself has been around for a while, so this is the second edition. And if you've not heard of it before, you sort of... It's basically following the the tale of the Odyssey. Um, So you're on the quest to find the Golden Fleece and then get back without being killed, eaten, whatever, by various monsters and storms and who knows what else and it looked like uh quite fun and i like the art and uh so yeah i haven't I haven't backed much considering how many months it's been since we lasted a, a kickstart corner averaging less than one one thing a month so that's i think that's good though because it means we're not wasting our money <laughs> Yeah. No, hang on. We're never wasting our money, are we? No. <laughs> I mean, I mean the the expansion, the playmats, and cat rescue were all sort of fairly cheap things. So uh, Argonauts wasn't that expensive compared to some of the games you see uh, on Kickstarter nowadays. Yeah. What have you been backing? I've got an interesting variety of things I've backed. So the first thing uh, is a game called Museum. So this is by Holy Grail Games, and it's a it's basically a set collection game where you play a curator in a museum and you're trying to collect historical artifacts to fill your museum with. And uh, you get points based on the size of the collection or different uh, sets of civilizations and things like that. And uh, I, I really like the look of it. And the uh, the artist by a guy called, now I'm probably going to pronounce his surname wrong, but Vincent du- Try Detroit? I don't know how you pronounce that. But apparently, he's very highly regarded. Uh, what was that, Pete? Sorry, he was being all French. Oh, yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> it's all right. So yeah, um, that was that looks really good. And that's uh, when's that due to arrive in August? So oh, that might be a, a, a surprise birthday arrival then for me. So it's not really a surprise if you backed it. 
Yeah, I suppose you're right. <laughs> you could forget about it. Yeah. It might just appear. I might miss the update that says they shipped it out, shipped it out and it might just appear. I mean, all of it's a surprise to me because I mostly just ignore all of the update emails. <laughs> Fair which enough. Go, yeah, Mark has read. Whatever. Yeah. The it other is... thing I had was a few different expansions as well. Like there was a Crystal Skulls expansion which comes with the, the base game, but there's also a, a Cthulhu expansion which I didn't back, unsurprisingly. <laughs> Uh, next up, I backed another Tiny Epic game, uh, which was Tiny Epic Zombies. Because it has item meeples. You see, that's all it takes to get me interested in a game. Just little little meeples you can stick things onto. Um, oh, yeah, of but course. But yeah, it's a Tiny Epic game. Little box, lots of components. And it's a uh, survival zombie type thing. So, yeah, not really much else you can say about that. Um, but it looks quite fun. Cool. Sweet Mess. Now, this is a game by a company called Big Kid Games. And uh, shockingly, it's a food-based game where you're making desserts in a baking competition. And it's got lots of lovely little components and things and plates with different ingredients on and stuff like that. And uh, see, I'm very yeah, I'm very predictable, aren't I? Food yeah. games or games that I like the art of. You know, yeah. it's just basically it doesn't take much to get me interested in a game. This one's got both, you see. <laughs> it's got this nice tray that goes inside the box as well to store all the components, which is quite nice. So, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. That's going to be December, so I've got a bit of time to wait for that. They've got a video on their um, Kickstarter page of Tom Vassell saying it's really good and it looks fantastic, and it's his pick of the week in one of his weekly Kickstarter videos. So, yeah. That's uh, hopefully going to be quite good. Awesome. And the last game I backed is a game from someone we've discussed before, and that's Kitty Cataclysm, which is by Bez, the person who made Wibble++ Plus Plus and uh, Inner Bind, uh, which Gareth uh, talked about on our... Was that on our UKG show last year he talked about Inner Bind? I think it was, wasn't it? Maybe, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm surprised you didn't back this, so I backed it instead because it's a game about cats... As you can tell from the name. Well, it it came it came up, and it told me I had forty eight hours, and then I misremembered when I'd received that email. Oh, right, okay. So then I was like, oh, it was more than forty eight hours ago. Never mind. Chaos card play, dickery, and cat puns. So you know, I like a good pun and a bad one. So it, this one again stood out to me. And uh, I, I, you know, I've enjoyed the games I've played that Bez has put out before. So I think, uh, yeah, it wasn't an expensive pledge, and uh, I look forward to the giving this one a go. But yeah, I can't wait, and hopefully we'll see Bez at UKG as well. So uh, I look forward to that. Uh, Pete, have you backed anything recently? Uh, well, I have been backing. Um, yes. Well, so I've done a group pledge for Dice Hospital, which I believe you're in, if I remember rightly. Uh, so that's am, very yes. exciting. Um, yep. I did another one for Western Legends, which is this big sort of Western-themed game about uh, bandits and gambling and all sorts going on. Um, yeah, sounds fantastic. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that. Okay, so that's what we've been backing. What have we had arrive? So I'll start this time. I've had a few things turn up. So I've had Kitchen Rush arrive. So this is the worker placement game where the workers are all little sand timers. And it's a co-op game where you're all playing chefs in a restaurant and uh, yeah, you have to do things before the timers run out, I guess. I haven't really looked into it too much, but I just like the idea of it being a nice fast and frantic co-op game. Because um, with things like Pandemic, you know, you can obviously take your time figuring out what you're going to do with this. It's going to be very, you know, you've got 30 seconds to do this before the next thing needs to be done. And I can imagine it might cause a few arguments when someone doesn't do something and things like that. So I'm, I'm looking forward to giving that one that a try. That sounds horrible. Co-op and timed. <laughs> I can't think quickly anymore. I, I, I saw it at, um, it was one of the ones I wanted to look at at the expo last year and didn't get a chance to. But as I say, it was on Kickstarter, so I, uh, I just backed it. Again, it's a food game, you yeah, say. Yeah, we're not so... fooled. It is just a food game. Yeah. Yeah, that's what it is. With a meeple gimmick. One that's not a food game. 
Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm not easily manipulated at all. <laughs> um, my next game isn't a food game, though, and this is Hardback, which is the next game in the paperback uh, series by Ferris Games, which is a word-building game um, where in your drafting cards that have got letters on them and you're using those cards to, to make words and uh, get points and buy new cards that have got better work well better letters as in one's worth more points and some of them have got actions that say if this letter contains so many vowels you get double points or whatever so yeah i'm, I'm looking forward to that i mean we, we briefly chatted about this didn't we Pete? you you're a fan of fugitive which is a, a, a ferris game but paperback didn't really it, yeah it didn't do much for me um i it was a while ago now but just ironically although i do like words i'm not a huge fan of word games so i think maybe it's sort of kind of yeah it's just it's not for me but yeah fugitive oh fantastic game really good yeah we've played that a few times yeah i was gonna say i do wonder if if hardback is not the final game what are they going to call the next one well, that's true <laughs> if they've got paperback and hardback. spiral bound maybe it'll be like <laughs> folio oh yeah monograph Blog. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> blog spot. Uh, well, blog, blogs are digital, and the next game that came for me was a digital one. You see? Nice segue there. Ha uh-huh. ha. Yeah. Uh, and that's the beta version of the Gloom uh, digital version, which uh, I've talked about before, obviously, but I got a Steam code through email uh, not long ago and uh, installed that. And uh, yeah, it's basically exactly what what you would expect. Uh, I've not played a multiplayer game. I've only played against the AI. But it's, yeah, you choose which family you want to be. You get all the cards. And then you see your hand with all of the cards on. And uh, as you play the cards on the characters, they'll sometimes react. You know, like they'll go, oh, that's not a very good thing. Or, yay, that's great. It's made me happy. Or things like that, you know. And uh, yeah, you just make everyone miserable before you, you kill them. I don't know... I think one of the main selling points with Gloom was obviously the, the storytelling element. And if you're playing against the AI, you don't have that unless you want to sit there and say the story out to yourself. But then the the AI isn't giving you anything, any, any feedback on that, which is the only thing I'm not sure about. I, I wonder if the eventually long term, they might want to get voice chat in the game. So if you're playing online multiplayer, you can chat to the person you're playing against and you can, you know, tell them the story and, and in that way. So maybe that's something they might think about. I don't know. But the graphics are, are nice and uh, the characters are all well animated and the voices go with them very well. Uh, the voice actors they've used have captured the essence, I think, of the the art very well. So that's uh, the digital version of Gloom. And last of all, uh, finally, it arrived. I had a bit of a wait for this. And it's Dinosaur Island. So they've had a few issues with the shipping on this this game. Uh, Originally, uh, apparently they shipped all the copies to, I think it was Games Quest. And uh, it turns out they had not sent them enough or somehow some got lost. So there's a group of people who were called the UK 60, who were 60 people who backed the deluxe version who never got their copies because they didn't have enough. So they've had to wait for more of them to be uh, shipped in. And then there's people like me who didn't back the deluxe version. I just backed the standard the standard copy. And I didn't get anything at all. And I was wondering why. And then it turns out that Games Quest didn't get any copies of the standard version. They only got the de- deluxe version. So I had to wait another month before I got my copy after the deluxe people got theirs. So... I mean, it had been in retail for a bit of time before then, so it was like, well, I, I might as well have not backed the Kickstarter. I could have just just waited and bought it, you know. But but yeah, it's arrived. It's got lots of lovely little components and lots of dinosaurs and things like that in there. And uh, yeah, I've done an unboxing video, which uh, if I haven't uploaded by now, I can't remember which ones I have and haven't done, uh, it'll be up soon. So yeah, I'm really looking forward to playing that. Big fan of Jurassic Park. Obviously, this isn't Jurassic Park. Let's make that very clear. Totally different. Yes, it has but, nothing, nothing yeah, in common. Yeah, nothing at all to do with Jurassic Park. Just you know, but um, but yeah. All right, so that's I'm really looking forward to to playing that. Uh, 
Oh, I got um, uh, one that you got as well, which you're going to talk about in a second. So yeah. I'll swing us into that, which was Dino Dude Ranch Hatchlings. So my copy that I got wasn't actually for me. It was for my friend who I've borrowed your copy from from a couple of times because when yeah. we've gone away to an event I've ta- taken it and, and we've played it together so it was her birthday um, a couple of weeks ago so I luckily arrived at the start of April so I boxed the reboxed it and uh, posted it off to her as a birthday present and she was very happy with it so she's got not only the base game which was included in the my pledge but also the hatchlings expansion I just went for the Hatchlings expansion, yeah. as obviously I've already got the main game. Um, and yeah, as you say, it arrived um, sort of beginning of April-ish. Um, and it's been sat in its cellophane looking at me going, <laughs> why haven't you done an unboxing video for me yet? Yes. Along with the other game that's arrived, which is the Shipwreck Arcana, or Arcana, depending on how you want to pronounce it. Um, which I believe I did mention when when I backed it originally. It's got lovely sort of esoteric art, and it's sort of a very small card game, um, but sort of co-op, and you're trying to escape before you get killed sort of thing. Um, And that too is sitting in its cellophane, looking at me going, why? Why haven't you filmed me yet? And I keep thinking, oh, I'll do it, and then I get distracted by stuff. The world. The cat. I, 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 yeah, the cat. Huh. I did also, I I also got the Gloom Digital uh, beta. But yes, I haven't had anything else arrive apart from Hatchlings and uh, the Shipwreck Arcana. Okay, cool. Pete, have you had anything arrive that you've backed in the last few uh, the main one I would talk about is Forest of Fate, uh, which is this lovely little, it's basically a choose your own adventure game. Um, it's uh, There's two versions, but you either have a PDF of the encounters or you paid more for a lovely little separate book, which I did. And uh, it's, it's quite a delightful game. You're basically a group of travellers trying to negotiate this fairly horrible forest and you have to match the skills from your travelers with how you think the best approach to dealing with the situation is Uh, so uh, horrible things can and do regularly happen in this game but you've just got to try and uh, survive until the end basically and it's very nice okay cool i've just realized i forgot to talk about a game that i backed so i'll do that now before i forget anymore um Seize the Bean, which is a game I saw we saw at the expo last year. Yeah. Um, which is the one where you run a coffee shop and you have to attract customers in. And it's the one that's got all those lovely little sugar cube components and coffee beans and, and things like that. And in fact, they've actually put the print and play online, um, which I'm looking at right now. And uh, it's got lots of different characters, lots of different uh, people who would come into your coffee shop and want different types of coffee. It's interesting. It's not like most of the games where it's like monetary based. It's all about the ratings that your coffee shop gets. And there's lots of things like people will leave reviews on social media, um, like one star reviews saying, oh, no, the floor is so sticky that I can't get out. Hmm. Or five star reviews, you know, um, this place is so good. I've never had such a great coffee in my entire life. So, uh, yeah, it's all about trying to get the best reviews you can uh, from the patrons. So... Uh, but yeah, I, I we didn't get a chance to play it at UKG last year because their store was so um, busy Round. every single time we went past. But we had a look at the components and it was it did look very nice. Yeah, they only had one copy and a tiny little table right at yeah. the fringe of the uh, hall. And I think uh, I think there are obviously quite a lot of people who who probably saw it on the um, like the BGG ones yeah. to watch list that we both found it on and went, oh, that looks fun. Um, probably thought the same thing as us and decided to uh, investigate. I'm just, I'm just got the, I've just opened the UKG app and I'm seeing if they're uh, uh, exhibiting this year. Quality Beast, they're called. Let's have a look. No, they're not on the uh, list at the moment, so we shall see. 
So let's move on to our ones to watch. Uh, I've only got a couple, um, so I'll go through those. And guess what the theme of both of my games is? Couldn't possibly. Um, zombies? No. Pirates? No. Ghosts? No. Cthulhu? No. Is it food, man? Hey. It's food. <laughs> so the first one is a game that is literally a filler game because it's called filler. <laughs> and it's a tasty pastry card game from Green Couch Games where you uh, run a pastry and it's a, a card game um, and you have a bunch of different ingredients and you have the ingredients in your hand and you use them to make cakes well, that's you know there's probably a bit more to it than that but that's all I needed to see yep Easily, easily convinced. Yeah, you, uh, and I turned into the little, you know, the little emoji with hearts for eyes? That was me when I saw this. Okay. Because it was quite cheap as well. It was only a $15 page level, so. Gosh. And uh, shipping was uh, five, no, $9. So um, that was not too bad. So I think that's about 20 quid all in. So that's not, not horrible. And the second thing I've got my eye on is uh, the expansion for Kitchen Rush, which we just talked about, which is called Piece of Cake. So it's just all desserts and things. So uh, it's got a nice little uh, expansion card that you fit onto the main sort of kitchen in normal Kitchen Rush. So you've got an extra little area to make the pastries and things. So, uh, yeah, that's a, uh, a nice little expansion for that. So, uh, um not sure if I'm going to back either of those yet, but uh, as they are food games, I would say the chances are quite high. Oh, but Matt, you've you've got to you've got to like diversify pick, my pick collection. The best one. Oh, okay. Eight of the two. Well, you've already backed Sweet Mess. That's true. Well, that's a dessert game. These are dessert. Oh, I see. So what you're saying is I should back these two, so then I'll have three games about desserts, and I can decide which is the best one. So I can review them all and compare them against each other. Is that what you're saying? Uh, not exactly, but go with that. Okay. <laughs> right, you are. Okay, what are you uh, keeping your eyes on? So the first one I was keeping an eye on was Fireball Island, which is going to be done by Restoration Games. Now, I had never heard of this before. I saw a video of uh, Tom Vassell reacting rather excitedly because they'd managed to keep it a secret from him, and it was one that he kept uh, asking them if they were ever going to do it. Um, and they've currently raised uh, £1.4 million, wow. pounds, which is uh, over $2 million for a $250,000 goal, which is a high goal, but they've... They've ended up with $2 million, and there's still a few days to go. So that will be, um, I mean, you get a lot of stuff in there. There's a huge sort of board with lots of, it sort of reminded me a little bit of Mousetrap, just more extensive, because there's little fireballs that come down from the top of the mountain which is in the middle of the island and they sort of bump down little tracks which you may or may not be standing on and you can twist trees to stop the fireballs from knocking you over and knock other people over instead and it just looked really fun and it sort of looked like um the kind of game i really would have loved when i was a kid um however it is 60 dollars plus 20 dollars to get it here. Yeah, I'm just looking at it now, though. It does look very nice. It does. Um, and it does look like one of those games. But at the same time, it also looks like it's going to be absolutely massive in terms of the box, because you've got to get that entire island back inside a box. So I imagine it's going to be quite big and heavy. Looks like it's in three parts from the uh, the video they, they put yeah. online. Um, I'm assuming they've... they've s- s- tweak the mechanics because that's what they tend to do isn't it if it's a slightly older game they'll modernize it to make it a bit more yeah uh, in keeping with the type of thing we'd have these days yeah um so it was the the number one requested um 
game that uh, people wanted them to see yeah. uh, restored. Uh, and they have done uh, some game upgrades. Um, I mean, to me, to me, I, I don't really. It doesn't really like figure because obviously, as I said, I've never heard yeah, of it before this. I think um, I sort of vaguely remember seeing this at one point. Looking at the pictures of like the marbles rolling down, it it rings some bells in my head, but I can't quite place it. Yeah, I mean, it just looks like silly fun. Yeah, it looks like a lot of fun. It really does. So, yep, that finishes Friday, May the fourth at four fifty nine a.m. British summer time. Oh, on Star Wars Day. Oh yeah. May the fourth. Yeah. Um. Except we're English and we don't say it like that. We say the 4th of May. We do on, we do on Star Wars Day. Do we? Okay. Yeah. May the 4th be with you. We have I've, to say I've like never that. actually said that on the basis that I'm not American <laughs> and I say the 4th of May. Yeah. Um, not that I'm belligerent or anything. No, no. But so, yeah, if you are in the UK and you do want to back it, be aware that it, it ends at like just before 5 a.m. on Friday. Yeah. So don't think you can wake up and back it on Friday. You'd need to do it by Thursday at the latest. And then one of the other ones I've got as one to watch is called Growl. And it's sort of, it's a werewolf game. It's it sort of, t it takes, um you know, like One Night Werewolf or whatever it's called, just yeah. werewolf. Um, and it's sort of extended it a bit. Um, and I... So, uh, I spotted this on um, one of the Facebook groups about Kickstarter board games because um, one of the designers was asking for people's opinions on the art, yeah. sort of which of these two versions, which one do you think fits this more? So that's how I spotted it originally. And the art is very nice. I do like it. There's lots of nice purple. I do, I do like things with purple in for some reason. And uh, it's sort of, it's very short, so it's like 10, 10 to 15 minutes. It says, you start off, you're either a human or a werewolf. And then you, when it's your turn, you draw the top card off of a pile and decide publicly who you give it to. So you've got things in there like bites and charms. So a bite... If you get bitten three times, if you're a human, then you turn into a werewolf. If you get a charm, then it cancels a bite. Um, if you get a wound three times, you will die. But if you find a salve, then you can cancel the wounds. And there's something here that says you can still win even if you die, which sounds interesting. And then there's also gold. Not sure what that does. Um, and then when it's the night phase or when the knight card shows up in the, the main deck, all the living players pass a card to the left and to the right. Then you shuffle all of the cards, so you don't know who gave you which card. So at the end of the final night, all the wolves growl, and we find out if they've taken over the colony. And all I could imagine was sort of a bunch of very awkward people sat around a table, <laughs> all sort of going, Gruh? at the end of the night and not really getting into it. Um, and it's only uh, $16 for the basic box. But if you want to back at slightly more, um, you get some extra stuff. Um, for, for $24, you can play up to 10 players and you get this weird sort of furry thing with eyes that you put the box in and it looks like a monster it's very strange isn't it i'm trying to th i'm trying to think what it looks like i'm sort of reminded of the the guy from trapdoor yeah it reminded me of um oh i don't know i don't know whether they actually have like proper character names but the yub yub aliens from um the muppets the yub yub aliens they always go yub 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 aliens this is, Google's this... sort of confused because yub yub is something Ewoks say apparently. Okay. Oh, it's the. Apparently, they're called the Martians. 
Oh, okay. the Yip Yip Aliens. Oh, yes, I know the ones you mean. There's a blue one and a pink one. But also, those two Muppets used to scare the absolute shit out of me when I was a kid. <laughs> they just freaked me out. Where their mouths moved. And it's just like, uh, something sinister about them. Yeah. So, my next one to watch isn't on Kickstarter, so it's sort of crowdfunding corner. No, no it's, it's, it's in Indiegogo Island. Oh, okay. So we're going over to IGG Island for a, a quick vacay. Yeah. Um, and not necessarily because I'm interested in backing it. I'm interested in seeing how it does. Now, if anybody's particularly into their esports, they've probably heard of a chap called Raynad. And he has um, launched a campaign on Indiegogo because he wants to get some startup to do his own game that um, he's been designing. Uh, and if you watch the video, he's sort of his typical self, and he says oh, he's been designing games since he was a kid. Um, um, you know, I don't know, whatever. Anyway, um, Raynard is, of course, quite famous for Hearthstone, and he's designing a digital deck building game. So it's still cards and it's still digital, but it's not the same as sort of um, collectible card games uh, like Magic or Hearthstone or whatever. Yeah, so he his his idea is that there's not enough... Well, in the video he says, oh, there's no digital deck building games out there at all, which is slightly incorrect, but whatever. I guess he's trying to get people invested. And he... It's a flexible goal on Indiegogo, so he'll get whatever it is that he gets, regardless. It's still a month left, and he's at 40%, so I'm pretty sure he'll get there. And I'm just curious as to uh, how how it will turn out. Yeah. Um, if you back it, you get, regardless of what level you back it, you get triple your in-game currency when it's released. So, like, if you back for a $5, you get $15 worth of in-game gold to buy, I don't know, whatever with. Um, I think it's to buy, to unlock classes. Because I think the idea is everybody starts out and you all get uh, one or two classes automatically unlocked and everybody has access to all the cards and then you proceed as a deck builder as you imagine a deck builder would go, you buy cards by doing this, that and the other and so on. In the event in, in the in the overall aim to, to beat your opponent. And the art looks sort of fun. Yeah, and uh there was Yeah, some of the art looks really fun. There were rumours that uh Mr Brode, formerly of Blizzard, might have been going to help Mr Raynard with this. Which oh, is yes. uh, interesting. interesting. Yes, that's another piece of news we didn't talk about, but he's gone. Well, he's left Blizzard. He's not yeah. gone, gone. He's not gone, no. But yeah. It's funny, though, because obviously he was one... I think he did a lot of work selling card packs for them, so it'll be interesting to see how that goes without him around. Yeah, especially the Bro9 videos. Yeah. But yeah, that's the bazaar uh, on Indiegogo. That's got a month left. Okay. Am I allowed to talk about cakes? Because it's not really relevant. Yeah, well, it's food. I'll allow it. And it's it's local. Okay. Okay. And then my last one is a little bit cheeky, because um, it's not actually to do with games. It's to do with cake. Real life cake. Um, and it is the lovely lady and company who made my wedding cake and then uh, the custom... Path of Exile themed birthday cake for Chris's birthday and our anniversary cake. So I've had three custom cakes off of them. So obviously they're very, very nice. Is Chitty's Cakes in Birmingham. They are baking a cake shop 
over on Kickstarter. Basically, they're looking to move to a slightly larger shop area that will have a kitchen, uh, a decorating area with a window in that you can look at people decorating cupcakes and some larger classroom areas to do like baking courses and so on. And I just thought I would mention it in case there's anybody in the Birmingham area who likes cake. You don't have to like cake, you could just like local people. Um, they're currently in Digbeth in the Custard Factory. The new place that they're looking to open will be also in the Custard Factory, um, but in the little courtyard opposite where the Mockingbird Theatre is. I, I can't help but think the Custard Factory is a apt place for a cake shop. It is. It is. And they have absolutely lovely cakes. There is a pledge level that offers free cupcakes for a year. Ooh. Yeah, how much is that, though? 80 quid. Well, that's all right. I'll but get that's, through that. That's, well, it's one cupcake a week, or if you go monthly, a box of four. Hmm. So that's still 52 cupcakes, and they are very nice cupcakes. Okay. Um, or there's a couple of pledges where you get to go to the sort of launch party or get tea and cakes for you and five friends, that sort of thing. Okay, cool. So, yeah, them's my ones to watch. Okay, Pete, you've got a couple that you want to talk about as well. Uh, I do. And they are coming to Kickstarter, but they're not on it yet. But uh, I like the look of both of them without knowing loads about them. And they're both British companies. Um, so Villagers is an engine building and car crafting game for one to five players set in a faraway land not unlike medieval Europe. The Black Death has taken a heavy toll and the survivors, people from all walks of life, now look to the future and gather together to build new communities. So this is a first-time game designer, Hark and Gather, and the company is called Sinister Fish Games, and it just looks rather good. Oh, I know Sinister Fish. They uh, created a game that I backed. I can't remember if it was last year or the year before, which was Great Scott, the game of Mad Invention, which was like a party game where you're making inventions. And I, I, I like that because that was the one that had all the alliteration in it. So yeah, I'm glad they're still around and doing other other things. Absolutely. So tentative launch date for that is the 15th of May. So just keep an eye out for that. And the other that I'm uh, very interested in is called Hero Master. And this is by Jamie Noble Fryer. Um, he is an artist um, who generally creates fantasy and sci-fi artwork for books and games. So he's now branching out into game design himself. Uh, and this is an epic game of epic fails, and it's a, a parody dungeon crawler card game. And I just am so attracted by the humour on all of these cards. I can imagine having a lot of fun playing this game. Sadly, I don't have a uh, date for this one just yet, but it's probably coming quite soon. So I would definitely take a look. Yeah, I've just found a thread on... BGG, which is dated, when, when did he post this? September 2016, where he first announced what he was working on and included some screenshots. So he's obviously been working on it for a couple of years. Absolutely, yeah. And, uh, I like his work, and, Yeah, he's put quite a lot of stuff, yeah. And, uh, yeah, that actually looks quite good. It looks like definitely a good, funny game like that is always, uh, is always good. Absolutely. And I would like one more shout-out, which is for... Uh, a game for long-time listeners of this show that I first demoed at Essen 2016. Oh. Uh, and that is Ruthless by Roland MacDonald, another artist-turned-game-designer. So I played his prototype, and apparently there has been a Polish version of this pirate deck-building game. Anyway, uh, n not really any details to share, except there are rumours that it is being picked up by a British publisher. So watch this space. Awesome. Okay, well, thank you for that, Pete. And uh, that takes us nicely to the end of the episode. So before we do our usual stuff, Pete, do you want to just remind people where they can find out more about The Great Indoors on the web and social media? Yep, certainly. So it's www.great-indoors.co.uk or you can find us on Twitter 
at the GI event or Facebook, just search for The Great Indoors. Uh, and I will just plug our NSPCC uh, charity board game day coming up in Bromsgrove on the 12th of May. Family friendly day. If you're in the area, then please do check it out. So for those people who want to contact us, uh, they know they can follow us on Twitter at Instagram. We are just at TOGCAST. Yeah, you can also find us on Facebook. Just search for The Offline Gamer or go to facebook.com forward slash TOGCAST. Uh, you can find the podcast on iTunes where if you like us, we would love it if you would leave us a review. You can also visit us for back episodes, videos and articles at www offlinegamer.co.uk and if you want to email us uh, which we would really like if people do because we don't get many emails it's offlinegamerpodcast at gmail.com or just go to the website and hit the contact us button and there we go it's been a long time coming but we are back woohoo so uh, there won't be uh, as long as a wait until the next episode um we're going to do a, a brief one soon. We're going to uh, do our Kickstarter rewards for last year that we would normally do in January. So we're going to put that out as a special mini episode uh, sometime, hopefully in the next couple of weeks. And we're hoping if we can get a good list of what's going to be at UKGE to do a UKGE preview episode as well. So uh, look out for those. Yep. So thanks again, Pete, for joining us. It's been great to have you on again. Thank you very much. It's an honour. And uh, everyone for listening, thank you for sticking with us and getting all the way through the episode. And we'll see you for our next one. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.